So when you started discernment, what were some of the challenges that you faced? Um, partly the, the fact that I hadn't known any women religious. So I didn't have an idea of what they might do or how they might live. I still had kind of this image of the sisters from the 60s because that was my experience was what was portrayed in old movies and I was completely lost in terms of what sisters might do and how they might live. When I felt called to religious life, I didn't feel called away from archaeology. And so it was, it was a question of, will you allow me to be who I am and to continue to be who I am? And so when people said no, I, it wasn't that I stopped discerning with them, but it made it much more difficult. Um, it also strangely made it more difficult when they said yes without thinking about it. Um, and I realized later it was because archaeology is demanding on the community in a way that if they, if they gave a blanket yes, it meant that they weren't concerned about how it would affect the community. And so a, a firm maybe was, as it turns out, the right answer because I do discern my ministry with the community needs in mind. And if the community needs me to do something else, then I really have to take that into account. In some ways, it's a great fit for uh, living in community because, um, you know, I work with animal bones or files on a computer, pictures of ceramics. The animals have been dead for 3,000 years. They're not going anywhere. If someone needs to go to the doctor or if there's something that's going on that needs to happen in community, I can be there. I can set my own schedule so I can be here for 6.30 prayer and 5.15 prayer. Um, that's less true now that I'm doing other ministries, but it was, it was true for several years that my, my schedule was definitely one of the more flexible schedules. But it also means that I'm out doing field work for a month. Um, in my mind, two months every year would be an ideal. But this year, all I could fit in was two weeks because we had community meetings, and so that was that. Those were the times that I could manage. Um, so, um, and in terms of thinking of it as a ministry, as a service to other people, um, I think Benedictines have always um, been keepers of history. Uh, historical records and um, monasteries in Europe, kind of towns grew up around them and they were kind of the center of the town and the stability of the town. And so they, they, they kept the historical records and they knew what people had lived where and how they lived. And, um, and so being able to tell those stories, um, I think is something that Benedictines have always done. And archeology span in particular, I think gives voice to the people whose voices aren't heard in traditional histories. As a monastic community, our primary ministry is to live community. And so we, we for the most part, um, we all live together on, in the monastery or on the monastery grounds. We don't all live in the same building um, and pray together and share our lives together. And that is our primary focus um, in ministry. And so we, while we do go out to work, um, those of us who can work outside of the monastery, our religious life centers around this monastery. Um, and we take a vow of stability to the community. We center our lives around that community. Almost nothing that I do now can't be done by somebody who isn't a religious sister. But um, for me, being a religious is about the way I'm called to become myself. Um, and that isn't necessarily about 
what I do, but how I do it. What drew me to religious life was living out community um, when I was visiting other places. And I didn't visit a lot of other places, but I remember thinking that if I wanted to live in an apartment with a couple of people, I would just do that. I was looking for community to call me to accountability and to guide me and um, nudge me when I got off the path and, and those, those kinds of things. So I was looking specifically for community. What we all do is we bring community to the work that we do. So we, you know, we, we live community out here with our, the 33 sisters uh, who are in this community. And then we try to bring that sense of, the way I've always thought of it is the unity of all people in God out to whatever it is that we do. So when I go to Armenia to do archeology, span I don't think of it as us versus them, it's all us. And I think we all bring that sense out to whatever ministry we choose to do. I did primarily archeology span before I entered and a little bit of work in an academic setting with students, um, but it was an academic setting and I was an advisor and um, and as an academic, I thought I was aiming for a full-time tenure track job and I was making myself miserable by trying to fit myself into this box and it just wasn't working. And I love the research. And I think part of it was that the research became less consuming for me. After I entered community, it, it wasn't as consuming and I wasn't as concerned about getting it wrong or upsetting people by what I was saying. I was much more focused on the patterns I was seeing in the ceramics and um, how I could work with them. In terms of the work I do in Armenia, I think I've become much more aware of the people with whom I do the work and the country. Um, Armenia is a, a recently post-Soviet state and I've been going there since 2002. And just paying attention to the changes that have happened there and the, the political changes and the economic changes and the changes in the, the town where we've lived and um, the cars that people drive. And people have pets now, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but when you're first building a nation, you don't have time or money or energy to take care of animals. And now people do have pets. Um, and, and so it's, it's, I think I notice that a lot more and think, think about those things much more. When I was a kid, we have what we call Legion of Mary, and our mission was helping the, the elderly of our parish. So I, I thought to myself, well, I, if I go to, to be a missionary, I'll be, uh, I like to go to somewhere the elderly. I feel, I found out I have a, um, a great rapport with them. You know, it's uh, kind of draw me to the, the elderly, it doesn't take. So that's, uh, and then uh, I was, uh, at that time, when uh, Pope Paul VI was calling launched the uh, appeal for missionary. The Little Sisters of the Poor was one of the congregation that respond to that uh, re, uh, call. So they came to Samoa. And then, of course, um, the first day they arrived at home, my father took a massive heart attack and it was the wake and they came in to stop by and no, because it's uh, their first time to be in Samoa and see a, a funeral in Samoa. So they came into my my house and we were talking and um, and then um, I asked them, what do you do? <laughs> and, they, and they said, oh, we look after the elderly. And that's, and um, 
that was um, once I uh, heard of that's what they do. I said, oh, that's interesting. When I really thought about it serious, I better do something about this being a missionary. I said, well, I'll go to the Little Sisters and um, I'll go to a place where the but then uh, our cardinal at that time, he, he said to me, because he's like a, um, an old uncle to me, and he said, the mother provincial of the, is coming over. So I, when she came, and I went and visited her, and I saw her, and she was very kind, and I said, oh, well, count me in. My background is nursing. Not every little sister is a nurse because there's so many different functions. They're, you know, they all need uh, different, uh, you know, you, we need uh, sisters who cook, administrations, they're, you know, so they're all, not everybody is a nurse. But we do have a formation in hospitality because it's, hospitality is our fourth bell. In the, 2013, they, uh, I was told to be, become a mother superior, so which is, <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> I said, Lord, you want me to be a mother superior? <laughs> so you, you better help me out. So my role as a mother superior is uh, because uh, of the community. My first role is, uh, my first responsibility is for the community and to help them, you know, spiritual, and also make sure that the, all the, you know, keep the community together and, uh, you know, and uh, also that we are all working together and living our, our rule of life or the, our constitution. That is the ask of each one of us. And then uh, my other role is uh, being uh, the, um, the president or the CEO of the of the, the facility. In our home here, we do some communities are very, very um, a variety of uh, different cultures. They are, um, you know, they're Hispanic, and you know, some are from from the islands, and some are from India or from uh, Africa. Here in my, our community here, I'm uh, the only one, uh, you know, from Samoa, but most, all of them are Americans. You know, when I, I say American, American with Scandinavian, and American Irish background, and uh, uh, you know, all that uh, kind of, uh, of uh, it helps to understand the different uh, nationality and ethnicity. Here in our home here in, uh, in Minnesota, we have a, a variety of vast diversity because of, uh, you know, our community, but also the, in the, our residents. Most of the residents here in the home, we are American. I think we have uh, one, one, from Viet, uh, Vietnamese, but most of uh, but the, our workers, our you know, our co-workers are a lot. You find them the whole world around me. We have you know in, from Africa and uh, Hispanic, and oh, we have a, a whole uh, variety. And uh, it's uh, someone asked me a question one day. She said. What are you doing for the immigrants? You know, which is, uh, I said, what do I do with the immigrants? I said, uh, I said, come visit our home. Come and visit us. Have a look. All different people here. These are uh, most of our, our workers. We're refugees and uh, refugees from different, and each one has a story. And it's so many stories because uh, because I speak French, I um, a lot. We get together with the French colonies, uh, the Bemunji, and and we speak. You know, but sometimes if I need something to say it faster, I say it in French to them. To you know, 
But it's beautiful because we have a, a lot of uh, different, uh, uh, you know, and uh, they, uh, when they come into the, to the country, they have a, they, we have a, uh, in Minnesota, they, which is very, very a good service, they have an international institute and for them, and they teach them life skills, and also how to for the you know the transition from one country, and then we we employ them, so and they're great, they're great workers, and uh, you know how they do things, their perspective of the elderly, which is one of the big uh, we can learn so much from them, because their respect of their the elderly in their own countries, and then I said just. When you look after the residents here, think it's your grandmother, and then you won't go wrong from there. And before I became a sister, I was a fashion designer. My experience with sister was uh, sister who were uh, more kind of strict, serious, you know, formal, uh, you know, obedience and things like that. Then I met a group of women who were invited to my parish for a retreat before Lent. And one of them was preaching. Preaching and women preaching. And she didn't have a habit. And that she was preaching about a personal relationship with God, which was something totally new for me. And I was kind of interested on those of women who were so different and so happy very joyful. And uh, that was the started uh, kind of uh, kind of a quest interested in those women because the later I learned, I learned that they were religious. And, uh, and their congregation was a North American congregation, which uh, was also, everything was kind of new for me. And I was just curious. Uh, at that time, they invited me to uh, to go to their house and say, oh, can I go to a religious house? I'm not being a sister. And, uh, and yes, and we started something called discernment. Discernment, what is that? And, uh, and again, uh, I invited a group of my friends. I don't want to go alone to this, this exploring. And this is when I, I met the sisters and I, I just was more and more interested in finding meaning of what I want to do with my life. Uh, but at the same time, I was so involved in, my, in pursuing my studies and my career that I was not ready at that time. I was 19. And uh, it took me 13 years to say, yes, the call never left me. The call uh, that I discerned when I was 19 never left me. And also the, the sister's life impacted me. The sister passion and compassion, with the pool especially. The integrity of uh, their work. They were involved with social justice. They were involved in teaching. They were involved, again, with many different issues that were very current in the island. And they even have a program of leadership for life for people who wanted who came from impoverishing uh, communities and areas and helping them uh, to find their own truth within them and their own strength so their voice can be heard and they can also advocate for their own ministries and their jobs and their communities. And also feeding the poor in the sugar cane. And these women came to my country. They didn't know the language. There were many who were North American. Some of them were from the island, Dominican. And the love they have for the poor people, it was amazing, it blew my mind. And I say, really, people can just give their life away in some way and start doing things for people they don't know? And I, I couldn't come like a grasp and say, I need to understand more of this. Those women, I found them so full of life and full of energy, and it was hard work. Well, in my work as a fashion designer, it was about me and myself and I. And it was more about making a name and becoming famous. While uh, in the religious life, what I saw was, it wasn't not about me, it was about us. That was the thing that was different. 
and uh, the selflessness and the meaning behind that that I give the essence to who we are and what we do, what we do. It's about love, right? Since I was a high fashion teacher, uh, our congregation had a ministry in the border, specifically in El Paso, Texas, and in, um, in Mexico, and uh, the border side of uh, Juarez. But at that time, I was, an, I was a novice at that time, becoming uh, toward first vows. It was a lot of uh, violence in that area, especially against women. And the ministry is for women who are were going under domestic violence, and they have a co-op, a sewing clothes, sewing uh, a church garments, a tablecloth. And the idea was to make a production uh, that will be like a, making clothes. And that was my training. I was so excited to do it. But because I am not from the United States, nor from Mexico, and the immigration issue plus the violence in that region make it almost impossible for me to go and pursue that ministry, which I was so looking forward to do. But then uh, we were looking what other ministry I could do. My sister is a doctor, my blood sister, and uh, I was her assistant many times in the island, especially working in, poverty, in public hospitals with poor people. And I was just helping her. And I was very, hospital work is like a second home for me. I grew up in hospital because of her. And since I was very young, and I was very familiar with the medical term. Uh, she trained me very well in the medical field, so to help her while I was studying with my free time. And then when I was a novice, I was invited to go to a clinic uh, to uh, do a kind of ministry, part-time ministry, very small ministry, where I was kind of a companion of people who came to the clinic who didn't speak English. At that time, my English wasn't that good, but was much better than the women who came because they were immigrants, were un un uninsured or underinsured. And uh, while I was accompanying them and, and meeting with the doctors, I also had time to sit down with them and listen to their stories. And me, being an immigrant as well, it was kind of, I was able to not only interpret their physical illness or struggle, also the emotional, which sometimes was hindering her health care. This is when I uh, was introduced to a hospital chaplain, chaplaincy, which I didn't know existed as a career. And this is when I, I, I came to Loyola to be trained and, and to become a chaplain with a clinical pastoral education program. I belong to Giving Boys, and I am part of the core team of Giving Boys even. And uh, what I see, uh, what is happening right now in religious life is very different than when I came 10 years ago. It's more and more, more diverse. Women from not only uh, racial uh, diversity, but also from different countries. And, uh, and I think that religious life has been opening and opening more. But uh, there is a lot of work to be done still to continue growing in the diversity in religious life in the United States. You know, we uh, are human. And our sisters in the different congregations are part of this humanity. And many times we, we resist. Uh, and we, uh, it's hard for some community to, to integrate the diversity that is in religious life today. And I know that some sisters have, have some hardship in becoming sisters in some congregations where prima, uh, uh, the majority are white sisters. And again, these sisters in these congregations are part of this culture. And uh, racism is, is many times present, present uh, uh, resistant to integrate uh, those cultures. It's hard, it's not easy. And sometimes we, we see more uh, multiculturality in a self interculturality. And I am blessed uh, right now that where I live, I live in a community where we celebrate both inter interculturality but also intergenerational. Intergener and uh, 
who has sister, and we name it, that our sister, even though they are white, they have their own background. We have Irish background, we have French background, we have Polish background, we have a sister from Cuba, another me from the Dominican Republic, another who is a mix of Irish, and also Scotland, and England. We try to be intentional, and take a lot of energy to be intentional in building the reign of God among even ourselves as sisters. I think religious life is richer now. These women who come uh, from different countries, they also come from different backgrounds. Culturally, also intellectually, and a different way to do ministry. Different way to celebrate our faith and our vocations. Different way to approach people. Many of them are people-oriented. They are community-oriented. Different than being individualistic, which is more uh, the, the, the pattern or the way is uh, more prevalent in the United States. Uh, the diversity that I see in religious life is just kind of like a, like a rainbow of color and joy and also passion. Because again and again, this country is becoming more diversified. And to having women with all these different backgrounds help to flourish our church and hence help and reach out more people who are in need. And each time I get with this group of women who are from all over the world, many times I feel like in the United Nations when I'm in the meeting, uh, help me to, to believe more in this religious life and in its future. But not only in the future, in the present, because this is happening right now. And even here in the hospital, when people come from CPE, sisters come from all over, from Africa, from the Philippines, just name it, different, Korea, and even Europe. People come here and to be trained to serve the people. When I'm around the equivalent of 11th grade, I start feeling this like nurture in my heart. But the sisters I'm interacting with, or these women in formation to be sisters, I could not find anything in common between them and me. I'm a, what people would call a free spirit, and they all seemed proper. <laughs> and they seemed so proper. and. And I kept thinking, why, why would God call me to this life when I cannot see a kindred spirit per se there? So I remember at that time we had a very kind Irish priest uh, resident in the parish next to our school and would have these conversations and he saw something in me then, so which was surprising to me because I think I was in trouble quite a bit in school and he would know about it, but yet he saw this something in me and would have these conversations about faith. Um, but it still took me 10 years after I finished high school to kind of make the decision to enter and try. And even then it was despite not seeing, feeling like I see people like myself in it. But my whole premise was, let me go and try. They might kick me out, they might not, but I think I'll have gotten this thing out of my system. I'll really have discerned whether this is my life. But prior to that, I had actually spent three and a half months living in a lay, a Catholic charismatic community, kind of discerning and spending more time in prayer because I realized at that time I was working in the capital city of Kenya that surrounded by my friends and uh, being young and having fun, I wasn't going to make a clear decision so I needed time apart from all that. So when I got to Dayton, Ohio, um, we have always been big supporters of Catholic social services. Um, but when I got there, Dayton is a welcoming city, and there was this influx of uh, former refugees from the DRC coming into Dayton. So I went to volunteer there because of Swahili, at least with the language I could help out with translating, and that grew. So eventually I stopped volunteering for Catholic Social Services and kind of just went out trying to meet the needs or seeing the gaps that the resettlement agency was not completely able to meet. And that has kept growing and out of that, now we even have a community garden where families can plant indigenous vegetables and try to mimic our diet, our native diet as much as possible just because I have struggled with the diet in this country and it has affected my health 
sometimes. So when they're coming in with bigger families and not as much money to be able to go to Kroger, for instance, and buy vegetables for a family of seven or eight, it's good to be able to have a place they can plant their own vegetables. And it's also good for, I think, community uh, relations. It's a time you can come and do something that you are good at without having a supervisor. Have time to share and relieve your memories of home. We all miss home in different ways. Um, so that's what I do a lot and I, my community has been very supportive. So how the garden came about is I actually wrote to my leadership and asked them for land because we had a bit of land line fallow and asked them also for the finances to support it for three years in buying the seeds and cultivating it. And we would do the rest of the labor and take the produce and they were completely in support of it. And since so many of our sisters come from farming families, their advice has been invaluable. When I chose to do this, I had never farmed in my life. <laughs> so in that way, there is now much more awareness. And I'm happy to say that there's a lot more focus on migrants and refugees from our community. And even when I celebrated my vows, just to see our mother house with people from so many different parts of the world, it comp that was something different. I think our conversations have become much richer. Um, we have a sister called Sister Jeanette who does a lot in, um, so we do homicide vigils in Dayton and she also works in an interfaith women's group, but she also does a lot of social justice seminars and even addressing things like white privilege and racism and then being able to hear from somebody living amongst them about my own experiences with racism, I think that helps to in shaping who we are and what we want to stand for and examining our own history and seeing whether there are things there that perhaps could have been done differently. And I think this is happening in so many congregations because a lot of newer religious are coming from other cultures. and. Uh, LCWR this summer made a stand against racism. And I think in that way, our presence is changing the fabric of our communities. And I can say this knowing that I speak to so many younger religious because we have given voice. So we do get together and talk about our shared experiences, yeah. I worked in an amazing ministry here in Chicago on the North Side called Emmaus Ministries. And it's a ministry that, it's the only ministry of its kind and it works with men engaged in survival prostitution. Um, I loved it for different reasons. First of all, we lived in a community, uh, people from different backgrounds, different faiths. So that for me was modeling uh, ecumenism in a very unique way. The staff members were also from all kinds of denominations. So whenever we had a day of prayer, once a month, you never knew what direction prayer would take, but it was amazing. So the ministry worked by having a center where the men could drop in. They could take a shower, do their laundry, but also get a hot meal. But we also went out at night onto the streets and tried to establish contact, telling uh, the men we met, there's a safe place you can come if you need help. Uh, with addiction, getting off the streets, we are there, but we're not enforcing it. So it modeled unconditional love. It was a place that could come and kind of leave uh, this stigma of the, the work they did behind. Um, it was an amazing ministry because I was only there four months, uh, but the day I was leaving, the men cooked lunch. And then this guy, Dimitri, Dimitri could sing like an angel. He sang Amazing Grace. We were all in tears. It was unbelievable. When I took vows, some of those men came. Now, I worked for the UN for a year with refugees also. And um, now Dayton, and currently when I'm in Chicago, I do one day of ministry at the Precious Blood Ministry of Reconciliation. Um, you never know what to expect. Each day is different. Um, if there's a place you can see the effects of um, racism and systematic structures that just are geared to oppress the people, it's there. It's a food desert. Um, then there's no recreational center within that area. 
our kids are constantly in and out of the system because they'll act out in school and instead of a parent being called, the police are called, they get a charge, they go to juvenile, that lingers with them. And um, it's, it's a very hopeful place, but it's also very sad because they question whether they will ever be able to make a step forward because they find so many things just push them back, keep oppressing them. So I do that one day a week. You sit and play games with them if they want to play card games. They are chess whizzes. So if you like chess, that's something you could do with them. Talk a lot. I cook a lot. I love cooking. Every ministry I've been in, I have ended up cooking for people. So we get some stuff from Trader Joe's once a week. So I try to pick, put up a big meal because I do find that when people are eating together, a lot of good conversations happen. Uh, and we try to support the staff who are there all the time in uh, bringing to life projects. Like now we got a grant and we're trying to create a network of youth from different parts of Chicago to initiate restorative justice projects in their own neighborhoods, but have a network where they come in for mentorship, just to support each other, but also to have conversations to realize that we are all facing the same problems. So to see beyond that, the siloing that has happened because of gang affiliations, and to realize we are fighting the same wars, we are facing the same issues of having parents incarcerated, having drug-infested neighborhoods, you know, having schools have, that have no resources for us. So that's so there's one staff member who's spearheading that, but so we offer support when we come in, draft the letters, try to uh, attend meetings, so kind of doing whatever you're told to do. I think the most important thing that you can show people is that you're there with them in the long run. And not to come in trying to offer solutions, but to really ask them what do you need and then help them, help them in that. And one of the things I've had to let go of is thinking I have answers or solutions and realizing that my priorities are not other people's priorities. So. It's mind-boggling sometimes when somebody who's making minimum wage will spend $100 on a dress. But that's not, that's not my life. And when you've spent 20, 30 years only wearing second-hand clothes, perhaps that's what you need to give you hope and motivation to, or to make you feel like you have dignity just like any other person. So our charism is all about reconciliation. I use healing myself because uh, Jesus as a healer is a very strong image in African culture. But healing and reconciliation for me are the same thing. And that comes about by restoring people's dignity and that means giving them hope and, and pointing out to them the qualities you see in them that are beautiful and good. And um, just standing with them, standing with them in those difficult times, but also being there with them when the good times are happening. Um, celebration is a huge part I've found of a lot of people who live on the margins. Uh, people will question and say, how can they have such expensive big parties? But when you've lived const constantly in despair and like with refugees, you have faced death so many times, you know, and escaped from it, it is so important then to really celebrate life.